thank you all for coming. I'm also really grateful that you're here and interested in careers and climate action, generally speaking. Um, in today's session, we are going to explore specifically the role of socially responsible investing as a key driver that can change the climate and social injustice crisis into societal transformation to support a more just, sustainable future for the people and the planet. And specifically, we have the great honor tonight to have an in-depth conversation with the founder and CEO and members of the leadership team from North Star Asset Management, who all happen to most be graduates from Harvard. Um, I will go over that in, in detail in a minute when I introduce them. And just by way of introduction, North Star Asset Management is located right here in Boston and is proud to be on the cutting edge of socially responsible investing with a mission to provide integrative and effective portfolio management by connecting social concerns to stock selection, asset allocation, and activism. And we are joined tonight by North Star's founder and CEO, Julie Goodridge, Chief Investment Officer, Nimrit Ken, and Paige Ryan, who is an investment, investment advisor. advisor. Um, Michelle Graham, who is the director um, of, or chief operating officer. And Ashley Cohen, who is the director of outside investments. So welcome everybody to our amazing panel. And I would like to first start with Julie. So Julian, it's an honor to have you here tonight. You have an impressive career. Um, <laughs> you have been in the investment industry since 1983. And you launched North Star in 1990. Right. Yes. I'd also like to highlight that you were the lead plaintiff in the groundbreaking case Goodridge versus Massachusetts Department of Public Health, which won equal marriage rights for same sex couples in Massachusetts, which is the first state in the US to do so. And additionally, in 2014, Julie was named one of the 25 most powerful women in finance by American Banker magazine. <laughs> and in regard to your formal education, Julie holds a bachelor's in philosophy from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard. So Julie. The perfect background. The perfect background <laughs> for investment. Yeah, perfect <laughs> investment for, for, so yes, that's right. Yeah, Those yeah, are right. exactly. So please tell us, based on your background, what inspired you to embark upon a career in the investment industry and particularly socially responsible investing? And mm -hmm. talk a little bit about how your education played a role in that and other pivotal life experiences. Okay, well, how many of you are undergraduates? Okay, when I got out of the, um, my undergraduate at Boston University with a you know, degree in philosophy, I became a community organizer. And so I went down to help people in Philadelphia squat um, homeless people and people who needed houses in, in abandoned houses in Philadelphia. That was my first job right out of college and I made $4,000 a year. Um, now it seems like, you know, that's, that's a small amount of money. And so I became very aware of how impossible it was to live on such a small amount of money. When I ended up, I ended up somehow um, applying to the ed school at Harvard and really focusing on human development. Um, and understanding people, how people learn over their lifespan. Um, and, you know, I thought, oh, well, that's really interesting. And I walked out of, you know, at, out of my getting my degree with a, with a $10,000 student loan. Um, now, $10,000 might not seem like a lot now because you guys might even have that every semester, right? A $10,000 loan. Uh, but for me at the time, and again, we're talking 1983, that was kind of a lot of money and it was a lot of money for me. So I had to find a job, I did the math and I figured out what kind of job, you know, how much do I need to make? So I was looking for educational administration jobs and I remember going to this guy and he said, you know what, I think, I think you're overzealous for this kind of, this kind of position. And I thought, well, okay. I came from a family of people who did only nonprofit work and I thought the only thing I haven't ever tried was working for a for-profit. What for-profits are there? I didn't even know of any. One, and what has a training program nearby where I can make the $18,000 a year that I need to make in order to be able to pay back my student loans and pay my, uh, pay my rent? And Merrill Lynch had a training program. And so I thought, oh, perfect. So I made my sales experience, I made my, my community organizing successes look like sales experience. And I went to Merrill Lynch and I said, you should hire me and train me. And so they did. 
Um, and what I found was that, you know, first of all, I had gotten a D in economics. Um, I'll have you know, when I was an undergraduate, I really hated it. And, um, and I realized, you know, pretty shortly that I didn't fit in with this crowd. You know, we've outed me as a, as a lesbian, so I'll just take that. Didn't fit in, okay? And at the time, really, there weren't a lot of women in the business, and I think, I think some of my colleagues here will be able to speak to that as well. So the long, very long story, and I'll, I'll wrap it up, but basically what I decided was that I needed to figure out a way to bring my values, which were really not necessarily environmentally focused, and I know this is a climate organization, but we're really social justice focused and climate is certainly a part of that. And I needed to figure out a way to bring that into the, my work even. And, and I started as a broker and a friend of mine had written a book called Ethical Investing, this woman named Amy Dominey. And I said, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. And, and just basically figured out how to do it. Um, left left you know being a broker because um i couldn't take it working downtown anymore i was the only woman and there were 125 brokers in the office i was the only woman i had my own private office and i had my clients but my clients were different than other people's clients and i needed to find a place where i could really think more about the kind of stuff i was interested in rather than uh, sort of doing what they told me i needed to do in order to be successful in that environment so how do you go from being a broker to founding your own company? So what happened was I um, went up, you know, I, I, again, I was working, so I was on the 31st floor of one financial center downtown working for at that time, what is now Morgan Stanley. And I just, I, I couldn't take it anymore. And so I looked to see how many clients I had and how much money I had under management and the kind of work I was doing. And I thought, wow, if I just, you know, again, did the math and realized if I just build, you know, had took these clients with me, um, I would be, that I really liked, the people I really loved and the people who were really socially responsible. Because again, I've built this business that's focused on socially responsible investing, incorporating people's concerns about, you know, human rights, race, gender, you know, income inequality, um, and into their portfolios, really, almost in the same way you would talk to somebody about philanthropy, right? These are my clients. I picked 10. I said, do you guys want to come with me as I start this firm? And, but this is, I'm going to have to bill you. And they said, yes. And, and so I filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And, and um, the one thing I'll tell you is at that time, it's very different now. And Michelle can talk about how different it is as our chief operating officer. But at that time, they said, are you current? I called, I said, I hadn't heard anything. It was, I was ready to quit at Morgan Stanley. Have you, you know, I haven't heard from you. Am I going to be denied this license? Because that would really sort of be a disaster, right? Then I would be unemployed. And they said to me, are you currently in jail for securities fraud? <laughs> and I said, no. And they said, oh, you won't have a problem. <laughs> so I got the license in 1990, and that's when I started North Star. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So I want to dive a little bit deeper now into what all North Star is responsible for. So on your website, you state that North Star's approach has been guided by your deeply held belief that the financial system is broken mm -hmm. and that people are suffering and that you need to help your clients use their resources to affect change. Mm -hmm. So can you give us a high level overview of how you and your team affect positive change for a more sustainable and equitable world through? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna let Nimrit talk about a lot of the, this stuff and also Ashley, but I'll just tell you high level that what, what we started to do is we started to say, okay, let's, we can divest from stuff. Like I know Harvard, at least the undergrads had this big you know, commitment to di divest from fossil fuels. You can divest from ExxonMobil, but it's not gonna make any difference to ExxonMobil. They do not care if you sell your shares, even if Harvard sells its shares, they don't care, right? Um, so the question is, if you're divesting, does that really mean anything? And then I thought, well, no, what really matters is if you find interesting companies to invest in. Well, are there any interesting companies to invest in? Well, there are, but the ones that are really interesting are pretty small, right? So that's a thing. Um, 
uh, can we invest in the in, in the local community? Well, yes, we can invest in these interesting community loan funds that that are direct investments in supporting you know the development of affordable housing, you know, by church groups. And so we did you know we were doing some of that. And then I realized that I didn't feel like investing in the public equity space was giving us an opportunity to really have a voice and to create any change at all. So we started this whole process of getting to shareholder activism. And that, so we've had these basic areas that we wanted. So the idea all along has been, are we creating change? Are we really doing what we say we're doing? What else is happening now that we need to address? And how can we figure out a way to attack that challenge? And um, really shareholder activism was, um, was one of the first ways that I really thought, you know what, in addition to outside and what we call outside investing and community, community lending and stuff, but it was a way in which I felt like, honestly, that was the way that we could stick it to the man, right? So if we see somebody doing something that we disagree with, even though they say, especially now, you see a lot of companies doing greenwashing or blue washing, people are talking about that now. At the, at the time, you have to understand this is 30 years ago, right? People weren't, igno they, were they weren't even putting out environmental and sustainability reports, right? So there was a big role that shareholder activism played in that. And we have had a pretty exciting um, piece. We've really sort of even carried uh, that role of activism further. But I think that the way that we carry it out is actually best described by my colleague, one of my colleagues, uh, Nimrit. All right, we turn to Nimrit? Yeah. yeah. So I think like, everything that uh, Julie said is right on, but one of the big premises why we think Northstar, what we do is so important, we're in the business of wealth management, right? So Harvard Endowment needs to earn a return so they can have these fabulous buildings <laughs> and right. all the programs, right? But that's also true for a family who might have a lot less, right? But they still need to pay for their retirement, for their children's education, and Paige works directly with a lot of our clients to do that. So you, you, that's the realm. So what are your options if you need returns? And we're all, you know, I went to HBS, it's all about returns, returns, risk and return, right? But what returns are we talking about? And what risk are we talking about? So for, for us, the returns is yes, public equities, you know, investing in companies that are growing is probably a great engine of wealth creation. It's been true for a long, long time, decades and decades. But when we do that, there are also all these externalities that we are basically allocating capital to, right? The number one that everybody is well know, now understands really well is tobacco. For the longest stock, tobacco stocks were the stocks to own, right? Because it was addictive, you could continue to um, have very great shareholder returns, and it would you would be hard pressed if you looked at the portfolios 10, 15 years ago, most investors, top funds would own tobacco stocks, right? Because they've created so much shareholder wealth, but they did a lot of other harm, right? And so all these different people that are investing in that, you are funding that. So I think that here's the alternative that a firm like Northstar offers, which is you no longer have to do that. You know, there, there are actors that we do not want to invest in. So tobacco is an easy one that everybody knows on, but oil is the same way, right? Big oil is the same way. We would argue there are a lot of other business models that are very similar. Health insurance is, falls in the similar way. So you, you can decide not to fund that. But I think where we're very different from the ESG world, and I came from the ESG world, there's this almost a mirage. You think you can rank companies and you can say, this is a better company. I feel better investing here versus here. I've ranked them. I've ranked them on all these metrics. I've looked at their green emissions data and I feel good that I've chosen the best of the bunch, right? The hard part I had, and this was where my biggest realization came in, you know, how do you evaluate a company like g and which has done so much good, right, with the medicines, but at the same time, this is the same company that has you know, if you, the opioid crisis that so many people are paying for, or the TAL crisis, or there's so many, the same thing goes for 3M, a quintessential American company, but their PFAS has polluted our drinking water, right? 
So how do you how do you reconcile that? Because on ESG rankings, they're right up top. They do so much. They publish this beautiful, glossy ESG reports. They have, you know, huge armies of ESG analysts who provide this data. And there, I think the for for me the big thing was there is no such thing as a socially responsible company. That's right. Right. Our sense of justice is evolving. Right. Your sense of justice is evolving, and how that's all putting together is. So that is our fundamental premise. We are going to invest in public equities, you know, not the ones that we don't, not the bad actors, but the other ones we are going to invest in some of these business models. But even the best of the best, we know are not perfect. And we know that that's where we can use our shareholder rights to advocate for, for them to make changes. And not only advocate to make changes, a lot of times it's, we see a burning issue. You know, for example, back in 2014, 15, um, Julie was reading a lot of articles in the newspaper and saw, well, you know, Pepsi, there's this huge uprising in India, Indian farmers, because of Pepsi was putting um, bottling plants everywhere. And, you know, if anyone knows anything about the Pepsi and Coke, their business model, it's very water intensive, right? So here you're t taking resources away from local communities and you're a big multinational. So, you know, this was one of those where um, Julie and the team at that time went in, filed several shareholder resolutions for Pepsi to adopt UN's uh, human right to water, right? And it took a number of years. It doesn't happen once. It's not like you file a shareholder resolution and they say, oh, thank you, you've come to us <laughs> and let's adopt this, right? Most of the times they do everything in their power not to uh, engage, but you know, it's gotten better over time. And, you know, but over time, you have the right management come into play, some the other the party on the other side, it's a burning issue for them, or they have sensitivity to that, and you get success. That's what happened with Pepsi, right? So we were able to get the UN human, um, the UN human right to water policy passed. And the reason that is so important is after that, the water conservation became a big deal at Pepsi and all other companies, right? But it was this little uh, company making a change or poking the big bear to get that kind of systemic change in place. And that's what we tried to do at Nordstrom. Yeah. And we try to find like interesting issues that, you know, you guys read about in the paper or whatever. We did a bunch of stuff around Citizens United. Um, we're doing stuff around prison labor in, in company supply chains. We then are now doing some work on fair chance hiring, uh, which is, you know, being able to hire people who have been incarcerated or have a criminal record um, with companies. And so there's just the idea is to take a, a sort of a cutting edge social issue and or, or an environment when I say social, I mean, you know, environmental, every, you know, everything and and look at the companies in the portfolio and say, how are how are these companies contributing to this problem? And what kind of conversation can we have with this company to try to get them to turn around and start uh, behaving differently or at least to consider uh, this issue in a way that maybe they have it in the past? Right. Right. Sure. Yeah. No, I, yeah, we should move. Well, wait, before we move on, can you share and read a little bit about your background? Yeah. How you got involved yep, yep. in investment? Yeah, talk about leaving the other, the dark that's side. Right. That's <laughs> right, that's right. I'm a reformed uh, uh, capitalist. That's right. So <laughs> it's really true. Uh, so I, can, I actually have my background in chemical engineering, so I was a very terrible chemical engineer. So then I thought, OK, this is not going very well. I should find something else to do. And um, so I said, okay, you know, it seems like it may, having a business degree is a good thing to do. So I went to HBS and I thought I would go back to the corporate world, you know, on my merry way. And, but I um, had this wonderful class with Professor Andrew Pearl. I think he still teaches, it's investment management. I loved that class, I fell in love with it because to me, and luckily for me, um, that I'm in the right profession, I love what investment management business is about. Not just about long-term security and all those different things, but it actually brings every facet of the business world and the operational world together. So when we're looking at which companies to invest in, and of course my experience has primarily been public markets. Ashley is the private person on our team. But so it's all about understanding 
what makes this business special, right? What, and how do we think in the long term, can this, do they have a sustainable edge that can go on? To do that, you need to really have a view on not only the financials, that's a big picture, but really the culture, the strategy, the management. So it brings all these different parts, and that's the part that I love about um, you know, investing long term. So that's how I kind of got into the public markets. I worked at a, a few different boutique investment management shops, very traditional. You know, some were more kind of, I would say, bold and said, okay, let's kind of incorporate this ESG metric somehow into our way of thinking. Um, so that's where I was. And it's interesting, you know, as I was saying, the more I dug into it, because I did um, develop and start and build an ESG strategy at one of the firms, a successful ESG strategy. But I realized how difficult it was. This was this cognitive dissonance going on. How can you reconcile a company's great on the environment, but not so good on some of the social issues. And an example, sorry, I love examples, I'll give. And it's actually the work that Northstar did, but it's a, 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 a beautiful example is, you know, there's a lot of push to invest in companies that are in the renewable supply chain, like a solar company. So one of our colleagues did a lot of research understanding, okay, sure, there's a lot of solar com uh, companies, let's invest in one of those companies. The more she dug into the supply chain, with 90% of the polysilicon coming from China, she found that a lot of that was getting in the Uyghur region in China. <coughs> so then how do you reconcile that, right? Some of those are hard lines, no showstoppers for us. For, so like when you have an abuse, like a human rights abuse or a major violation, that's a no-no for us. But there might be others, right, where there might be companies in the US where we would just ask them to do more work on their supply chain and be more transparent about that. So that's the difference. But going back to my North, how I got to North Star. So I was going through this phase where I was kind of doing ESG, but it felt like it was more of an asset gathering exercise. Couldn't reconcile all those different places. And that's when I got connected to Julie. And the more I read about that, it is, you know, it's, it's almost not it's almost too bold to take the stance that no company is socially responsible, but you almost have to if, if you want to affect change, right? And use those rights to um, do that. But uh, one of the reasons, actually, Julie was very hesitant in hiring me because she thought I was She's a, a troublemaker. Cap capitalist, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you know about those people, especially the ones from HBS. <laughs> That's why not only she hired me, she hired two more. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, can you pass the mic now to Michelle? So Michelle, you want to share a little bit about how you got involved with North Star and about your career in the financial service industry? Yeah. Did you have at HBS as well? Yeah. yeah. So um, so I started North Star about a year ago, shortly after Nimrit started. Um, and I graduated from HBS. Well, we had our what, 10 year? 20 year. No, oh, I don't know about no. you. <laughs> <laughs> we had our couple year anniversary recently. <laughs> Um, so I got into finance very similar to Julie, right? Um, my parents are immigrants and um, I went to Georgetown undergrad, had a lot of student loans, and to pay back those student loans, the best way to pay it back in a very cost efficient way was to go to Wall Street. So off I went to Wall Street, did the traditional investment banking job, grinded out for two years and sort of at the end of that, I was sort of like, what am I doing? What is all of this for? And I went to work at a philanthropic venture capital fund. Loved the work I did. The work was to really build and grow industries within New York. Um, but then I also realized I really didn't, wasn't able to make the full impact that I wanted to. And so off I went to HBS. HBS, um, you know, I did I did take some invest management class never talked about. I also did social enterprises classes. And I realized that eventually that I was going to come back and do something that had more meaning um, behind it. And um, and, and then had you it. went to Goldman? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Julie, I had to pay back $100,000. <laughs> yes, so right I did. The Nos, right? <laughs> yes. So I went, to, yeah, so I did go to Goldman and I had to pay back my debt. <laughs> and then um, I, you know, it's interesting, right? So, um, 
when I decided to come to North Star, it, you know, for me, you know, um, it's always about when I think about decisions in my career, right? It's what's the impact am I having? You know, what's the purpose of it, right? It's not just about going to work every day, but like it's what's the broader meaning of it? And so I needed to have that. I was slaving away in New York at Goldman. It was right around pandemic. And so you started to question everything, right? And then I was also looking at, you know, so I did say that I did a lot of finance work before, right? And there came a point when I realized I didn't necessarily, you know, I wanted to be within finance, but was I motivated and interested by, you know, looking at a, 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 um, a stock monitor every day? But did I like the work? Did I like the industry? Was I motivated by the people I was with? Absolutely. Um, and so I moved, moved into operations, right? For me, it's about how do we drive efficiencies? How can things be done better? How does a company operate? And I wanted to do that within the financial realm. And, you know, North Star, as Mimmer talked about, right? We've been around, Julie talked about, we've been around for 30 years, right? And we're sort of at this inflection point of figuring out our strategy, figuring out our growth, and really looking at, you know, um, what does that all that mean for the next, you know, 10, 15 years and building on the legacy that Julie created and making sure that we continue to build positive impact. So that's kind of what, how I came here. Fantastic. Can you share a little bit more about what you do on a daily basis? Oh, what I do on a yeah. daily basis. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So she tries to find your computer core. <laughs> We won't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that our some a colleague may or may not have taken, and other colleagues may or may not have looked helpful for today. So as as a CEO of North Star, right? Um, you know, we are. You know, a lot of my job is spent in looking at our technology. So we are in the midst of um, putting in place a CRM client relationship management tool. We are also putting in place a portfolio accounting and a uh, portfolio management and also trading um, system. So a lot of my job is spent looking at what type of tools and technology will help make our jobs more efficient and will also um, you know, help us grow. So a bit of that. So we also do compliance. As Julie mentioned, um, and we are regulated by the SEC. The SEC, um, you know, depending on the government that's in office at the time, there can be have more or greater regulation, but we are regulated and there um, are more laws coming out and rules coming out. So I work with um, our compliance consultants to make sure that we are in compliance with the, whatever rules and regulations that are out there. And for example, we're in the midst of an SEC I say that? Yeah, we're in yeah. the midst of a, an SEC audit. Basically, the, the SEC comes every few years to every firm that, that's out, that's regulated, and you need to make sure you have your books and records in order, and so you answer the questions and you make sure that you're in compliance with those rules. And any emerging new rules that come out that you're still keeping abreast and in compliance with those rules and regulations. You know, and then there's also things, you know. Uh, personnel, Michelle. <laughs> I talk about our firm because our firm's a little different than other firms. Yeah, so we are, um, we're, we're a small firm, we're 16 people, um, and we are mostly women, we're mostly women of color, and, um, you know, so with that, you know, it's managing all the nuances, you know, the personalities and making sure that we have an environment that is collaborative, that also embraces each person's differences and each person's unique perspective and thought and ideas and making sure that everyone has that same that safe space that they feel like they can share and that they can build and grow their careers right at the firm. You know, I think it's easy to say that when you go to a large firm like a Goldman Sachs, right? or, you know, as also an American Express, a large, these large firms, you go to them, right? And you, it's pretty easy when you come in, you know, you start as analyst, you go and do this other job, you go and do this other job, you do your, your coffee chats with folks, and it's lockstep, right? At a smaller firm, it's, okay, what do I want to do? How do I chart that? And it's a little bit more exploratory. It's more about what you want to do. So a lot of my job is spent, you know, making sure that we cultivate an environment where people have the space to think about what they want to do and how they build and how they grow, certainly in the context of what we need and how we develop as a firm and where we're looking to grow. 
Um, so I do spend a lot of my time doing that. And also too, right, um, it's, you know, everyone's different. Everyone has unique thoughts and ideas and they bring that in a different way. And so making sure that everyone's voice and thoughts are heard um, within the organization. And then I will say too, like one of the things that we grapple with is out of COVID, right? People, um, you know, everyone was in the office before COVID, right? And so, you know, we are a Boston based firm but a large section of our company is remote, right? We also have folks who are, who are hybrid. We also have folks who are within the office. So it's really thinking about how do we achieve our goals, but also maintain an environment that's flexible, but also maintain an environment where that's collaborative and people can share um, their ideas, but also, and also grow and develop their skill sets. And that may evolve and change over time. Like I was telling Ashley, too, I think it was you, Ashley, I was telling you today, when I, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, so when I, you know, came with an analyst, like when I needed to learn to do something, I would show up at someone else's desk and go, okay, like show me what you did, you know? And I would sit there, you know, for me, uh, if someone says, oh, let me screen share with you and show you how to do it, I'm like, please don't. Can I just come by and do that? That's, it, it's just a different learning style, right? And so we need to evolve, um, you know, how we um, develop and train our upcoming, our staff. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh -huh. So turn to Ashley now. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Ashley. <laughs> I've been told that I speak softly, so I'm going to try to, um, yeah. Okay, how, how am I doing? Can you <laughs> incredible. Okay, <Fantastic. laughs> so can you share a little bit about your background? You went to HBS. I did. I don't know if Julie knew that about me. No, so. no, no, I'm a little bit nervous now. I'm not holding it again. Exactly, you. exactly. So yeah, so, I did, so I'll start at the beginning, uh, which is so I studied Arabic for what feels like a very long time, though now it's been an extraordinarily long time. So, um, so I studied Arabic, I think, for like seven years. And kind of my second time studying abroad, I realized Maybe this isn't for me kind of long term. To back up a little bit, I had read, I think it was The Omnivore's Dilemma several years prior to that, and sort of realized the way that our food system um, was impacted by profits. And I think from there, always had a curiosity about how our economy works, how our business system works. And so anyway, fast forward, I'm in Morocco, and I'm like, similar to everybody here, I did not want to struggle financially, right? And so I think in an ideal world, sure, I probably would have, well, maybe not, maybe would have considered something in the more explicit social justice or like impact sector and sort of stumbled upon impact investing and thought it was the most amazing thing I had ever heard about. It made so much sense to me to both correct in the ways that we talked about, the way that business has erred, but also to use it as a fuel and a force to move forward, right, to actually um, achieve change. And so I was extraordinarily lucky. Um, I had my first job at a firm called Cambridge Associates in actually based in Boston. I was based in San Francisco and I was on kind of like the manager research side of things. I didn't know what I was going to think about investing. I had no idea, right? I'd studied Arabic and like definitely didn't know how to count. And then to like Nimrod's <laughs> point, like I think the cool thing about investing is it's sort of like we were talking about a stock the other day and I think it's kind of a lens to sort of think about the future, right? You get to like think about things like psychology, things like um, human trends, things like um, supply chains. I mean, you get to, it's so interdisciplinary. And so I feel like on a day-to-day -day basis, we just get to meet the smartest people in the world and hear about their visions for the future. Um, and so I, I, I and stepping back, I don't think I probably could have found a better career. So anyway, that's kind of how I stumbled upon it. And then I actually met Julie like several yeah. times. Yeah. I, I was like, I don't know if you were following me or I was following you, but it felt like every three months I was seeing Julie or someone else at North Star. And so kind of got to learn about the firm pretty organically that way. I believe I tried to keep you from going to HBS. It's true. It's <laughs> true. And then it's when true. you got into Yale and HBS, I said, you got to go to HBS. <laughs> I so you would be cold nearby. Yeah. <laughs> I don't look good red, but. <laughs> but what about your experience at HBS? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so basically I went to business school because as I mentioned, I like didn't really know how to count. And so I was like, okay, I feel like I should like learn the fundamentals of finance. And I feel like I knew I was like on the right track when I would like come into class and like 
the PE person next to me, I'd be like, what did you get? And he was like, 10%, Ashley. And I was like, I got 10.2%. And so anyway, like, I feel like it really, really gave me a lot of confidence because again, I hadn't spent the last, like, I felt so like, I didn't get a D in economics because I didn't even take it, right? And so I'm like, I feel like most of my peers were able to speak with a confidence that I couldn't. And that's what HBS gave me. And talk a little bit more about what your unique role is. Yeah, so I get to do all of the cool stuff they do, and I, we all work together on this. So I work on like outside investments, which is our term for investments outside of the public markets. And so, as Julie mentioned, we 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 do what we can to make good of like this large and complicated public market system we have, though we also see a role to intervene at a community level, and that's what we do on the outside investment side. So this will, it's like maybe what people think of as, as private markets investing. We don't do any of the traditional stuff like venture capital or private equity or like private equity PE or private credit or anything like that. Really, we're looking at community level projects, community stewarded solutions that we're able to support. I think what we do really differently is meet communities where they are. And so it's not often where we're like, well, what fund, what structure makes sense for you or what return makes sense for you? And I feel like so much of our industry is driven by what works for the investor. And like we try to really, really flip that on its head and be um, more accommodating, right? and recognizing that like certain communities right don't have the same resources and how can we be as flexible right as we possibly can be fantastic yeah i'm full we turn now to page if that's okay oh yeah that's awesome. I studied Latin and ancient Greek. I was a classics major, so I had spent eight years really dedicated to Latin, seven years really dedicated to ancient Greek, and then I spent like five years committed to absolutely nothing after graduation. <laughs> so I, I bounced around a lot. I was very distractible, um, but I was also really interested in, um, in agriculture and, and food networks. So I did quite a bit of small-scale farming, singing the same song, had a lot of debt from the, all that classics I studied and it was not making a lot of progress on it with small scale farming. So I moved into education because at least that was stable and it gave me some time to evaluate and realize that I actually had to organize my own financial house. And so I was making inquiries to financial planners about how, how can I, how do I do this? How? And they were like, you need to make more money. And I was like, great, thank you. <laughs> so um, I knew I wanted to be in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, that's, that's home for me. And so Charlottesville is a small town. I knew I wasn't positioned well to take on more debt with another professional degree. So I went the Charlottesville route of being like, I will, I'm just going to go for being a director of a nonprofit was the sweet spot for this town. So I went and I worked in management for a small nonprofit, a health and wellness nonprofit. We offered yoga, massage, acupuncture, and meditation on a sliding scale based on income. The, what I did with the, it was a, we had a full-time team of two, and what we did was transition those services from being on a sliding scale based on income to being on pay what you can ranges. The nonprofit also took our services out to uh, the local women's prison, the juvenile detention center in the area, to low income nursing homes, to uh, public housing centers. So what I was doing was having a lot of conversations with people about what two, five, ten, twenty dollars meant to them as we were trying to we were trying to change how we ran our organization. And at the same time, I'm doing large scale fundraising with donors in our area so that we can actually make these programs sustainable. And that's when I met Leslie when we so she was at the Uni University of Virginia um, and we're doing some parallel work in services that teach you how to calm your nervous system, um, which I really believe in. Right. I believe in all of us figuring out how to take a deep breath, like at least once a day. And then in 2017, there was the alt-right rally in Charlottesville. Prior to that, it was not as in the news. There was a KKK rally that same summer, about a month and a half before, that really impacted how that alt-right rally was policed. But what happened was, as being a counter protester at the KKK rally, I then got a lot more involved in the organizing in advance of that alt-right rally that was 
very publicized and terrible and disgusting. That really changed how I thought about how many hours a day in my life I was going to be needing to show up for work, how I wanted to use that time professionally. When I think about Americans who are living in poverty and living adjacent to poverty, and it is an extremely stressful existence. Um, and so then I started questioning how, how do I use my time to try to close the racial wealth gap after watching systematic racism function in the its most gross and explicit structure that we've seen in a while firsthand. I started, started having a lot of informational interviews around Charlottesville with financial planners saying, I think this is what you do in your day to day. Is this actually what you do? Because I think you just get people to tell you their secrets and then you tell them how to fix their financial situation. And they were like, that is correct. It is a trust building industry. <laughs> so that's what I do. So I worked for a more traditional financial planning group in Charlottesville to get acclimated to the industry, knowing that that wasn't my forever home. Thought that maybe my own shop was going to look a certain way and then found a group that's been doing this for over 30 years and is tackling the same issues that are important for me through shareholder activism with a lot of history um, that was thrilling for me to find. So that's what I do. Now I get people to tell me their secrets. You can find me after. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm client facing. So we, we have a lot of wonderful clients. The great thing about our clients is that we have a lot of values alignments. Things that are important to me are important to my clients. So that's a great place to start. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right. That's all. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Sure. Open it up for questions. Yeah, okay. Sure. Sure. okay. Yeah. All right. So anyone have a question? And I would ask that you come to the microphone just up to the front if you're okay with that. So I want to say one thing because if you think about if you think about um, you know did I I personally never set out to do any of this. I tell these guys this all the time, and and they they can see where I what my weak spots are, right? <laughs> but but. Um, you know, I never set out to be an entrepreneur and I never set out to do this. And I know that um, I, you know, I have a daughter who graduated from college and now she's in graduate school or whatever. And I watched her be in class with people. And I know this is true at Harvard, um, where people felt like they knew that they had to be pre-med and they knew they were going to be doctors. And they knew they were going to do this thing from birth or their parents <laughs> told them this is what they were going to do. And um, I didn't you know, fortunately or unfortunately have that kind of perspective in my life. But I have always said that this is, there's a term that a lot of nonprofits use when they're discovering what the next thing is that they have to work on, or a lot of social change activists. It's called make the way while, make the road while walking, right? So it's, I believe that every decision that you make um, will make sense to you by the time you're 60 years old in terms of your career. <laughs> and I just want you to know that it won't make sense now and everybody will think you're crazy, but at some point it will all make sense because you are uniquely who you are. And so what you have to do is figure out not what you're going to be when you grow up, but what is the point that you need to get to next that's interesting to you. Sort of like the way um, all of, everybody honestly has approached having a career. Um, and one of the things that that leads into is the sense of evolution. And remember, I talked about the stages of development that we have as human beings. And this idea of when Nimrit referred to our what we're trying to capture at North Star is an evolving sense of justice. Right. So the justice evolves over time. We understand what was wrong with what, you know, how we answered that question yesterday. How can we change it? To, so tomorrow is a better day or we have a better answer tomorrow. And I think that's that's one of the things that I know in terms of being able to start a company and constantly question, are we doing it the right way? Is there another way we can be doing it? it do I even know the answer? Don't I need to hire somebody like a Nimrod or a Michelle to come in and you know, figure certain kinds of um, certain kinds of things out, and that's and knowing what your weaknesses are, but but not losing sense of kind of you know what your your 
your vision is for the world is, is, is uh, really important. Um, one of our visions, the vision was to have an, an, even though we're not allowed to say this, an all female investment company. Why? Because there wasn't one. There wasn't one. And I, and so, okay, so we've had um, men working with us from time to time. We have, you know, but that's, but that was the vision. And then the next vision was, it wasn't enough to be, you know, lesbians, straight people, whatever. We had to be diverse, racially diverse. That was a goal that we, uh, you know, sort of set out on and, and maintain. And it was part of this evolving sense of justice. I don't know, maybe somebody will say something. Do you have anybody have a question about that? No? Yeah, yeah, he's you were not your head a lot the whole time. <laughs> oh, I got the mic set. I mean, I have a bunch of questions, but they're not really well formulated. That's so, all right. Um, I guess on this kind of evolving sense of justice for any or all of you or the firm itself, what needs do you feel needs to come next? Either as individuals or yeah, the firm. Oh, that's that that's question. <laughs> Ashley. Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> you know. I think, oops. Okay, so I think impact investing is at a really interesting inflection point where it's kind of like we can do well and do good. I don't believe that. So um, a little bit of a backstory. I was like meeting with an affordable housing manager several years ago, and I was like, "What does affordable housing mean to you?" And he said, "Affordable housing to me, I affordable housing is as affordable as it can be while still meeting investor returns, right?" And so I go back to this like we are still orienting so much of this industry around what investors want, what investors prioritize, what investors care about. And investors have power, they have privilege, they have money, they have comfort. And so until I think we change that equation, um, and so for me, I don't, even, even acknowledging it, right? Even acknowledging that maybe these two things aren't compatible for me would mean a lot of success. But I do worry we're going down a little bit of a wrong road here where people I think are, are, are sort of, um, I think overly optimistic about what the confines of traditional investment terms and, and approaches and, and all of that can be. And so there, I think there is a movement that's starting to question that and challenge that. And so that's really exciting, though um, that is one area where I think that I'd like to see us uh, keep going. And I think what we do a lot is acknowledge the contradictions. And I think that that is, um, yeah, something we talk about a lot. I have a lot to say on this. How much time does it have? You have a mic already, see. <laughs> um, so it's interesting, right? One of the things, I don't know if you guys have seen recently in the news, there's been a lot about the unions, right? Like the GM, uh, the United Auto Workers strike that went on. It's killing the margins. What's going to happen? Same with the UPS. There's more and more. So the traditional Wall Street, that's bad. It's bad for the profit margins, it's that. But if you look at the historical context, you know, 1970, the whole way after the World War II, the boom, one of the best periods of the economic prosperity in the US was when, you know, you did have this divide, the economic inequity was a lot lower than it is now. And I would actually say one of the reasons the economic in inequity has just skyrocketed really since 2000 is because shareholder supremacy, you know, like this whole model that it's shareholders at the expense of everyone else. Mm -hmm. And so when we, when, when in the media, you hear people like us talking, it's very easy to say, oh, here goes the Vogue, uh, you know, and there's this all anti-Vogue moment going on. But you really have to say, is this sustainable? Right. Like one of the things I will question you, the whole point on, you know, where do we see this evolving? The U.S. CEOs, right, the pay ratio and everything else. And I learned this because I used to study the annual reports and I'm like, well, they're getting, you know, huge millions of dollars in pay packages. That's great. Then they get retirement benefits that are really luxurious, like for the whole com family can go vacation in Bahamas forever. I don't know. But <laughs> stuff like that, like health care, all that. Meanwhile, an average worker is not getting the you know the benefits not only that we've outsourced that the companies that used to have departments of people managing for their retirement no now that's on you 401k you figure out how you're going to do that right so we all agree that you know 
com- people who have the vision and run these companies, like the CEOs, the C-suite, they need to be compensated. The question is how much and have we reached that extreme point, right? So I, that, I think that's one of the things that I see that in the U.S. that has gone to an, a, an extreme. And as we look forward, I do think there will be a reversion. Right. I mean, we're all like howling on this interest rates and whatnot and the debt and everything else. Well, who told anyone to cut the corporate tax rates to 22 (laughs) percent? Right. But we did to again spur the whole wave of profits. And any the history is the humankind history is any time you suppress a group at the expense of another, it's not sustainable. So that's the first thing I will say. The second thing, which is more relevant to the Salada Institute, is the whole concept of ecological limits. You know, we read the statistic that if we even continue at the growth of 3% GDP, we're going to need another planet in like 20 years, right? And we've seen these extremes. It's like not by coincidence that you're having these record (coughs) floods and droughts and whatnot all happening at the same time. And that spurs all kind of like I, I heard this speech from actually Al Gore. But like climate refugees, right? Right now we're having in New York and parts of Massachusetts uproar over a million immigrants, migrants coming. Mm -hmm. What does that look like when it's one billion? Because you know that's where we're heading, right? So, exciting. (laughs) Yeah, I was gonna. uh, I was just gonna say when you see somebody like. Is it Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk that's doing the rocket ships? Which one? Musk. Okay. There's a reason he's doing that. And when there was just something in the in the in the paper the last couple of days about you know looking for rare rare um, minerals on other planets or you know on a was it a comet or something I don't know, but you know that's what these guys are doing. I mean they're saying okay we can't find it here we've destroyed this planet now we're going to go out here to find it. And, um, you know, th- there are ecological limits, right? And, and if you, I don't know if you guys, have you ever seen the movie that Robert Reich did called Inequality for All? It's a really, it's a really good movie because what he talks about is that a rich person only needs so many, um, a multi-billionaire or millionaire only needs so many pairs of blue jeans, right? But, if, but families with children you know, who are working at three different jobs to try to make ends meet are are buying a lot more blue jeans than that one guy. So when when Nimrod's talking about the wealth divide, it's about, you know, when you're very short sighted, the capitalist system is so short sighted. Who is going to buy this stuff if they can't afford it? If every dollar is, you know, going toward their rent or going toward their health care or going f- toward daycare or, you know, not to sound like a, you know, I know people say, oh, that's a socialist perspective. Well, you know, we used to have, be, you know, we used to have a tax rate for the wealthy that was decent. It was high. It was a lot, you know, and it would affect our earnings, at, you know, because we're in financial services, you know, it would affect our earnings. But it's also something that that made the country run. Um, so you, you kind of have to decide, is it about your, it's sort of like the, the whole world is going through this now. Is it about you personally, uh, feeling a sense of, of agency and, and success, or is it about, you know, sort of the greater good? And that goes back to early, you know, my philosophy degree. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so thank you everyone. Um, really like listening to you. I'm good to see you again, Ashley. Uh, she was uh, at the, we have this uh, social innovator program at HKS, so she was there uh, venturing us yesterday. So uh, my specific question is definitely to everyone, but I, I would like to hear from, from Julian in specific, uh, because not every time you get in front of someone who is managing a multi-billion AUM social impact focused investment firm, um, if you look at the world as it is today, um, theoretical economics say that you would move capital from where there's less yield to regions where potentially there's high yield, right? Because there's deficits in there. Um, and if we look, if we split the world into two as it's usually done. We have the global north and the global south. The global south, there's a deficit in capital. 
So uh, what you expect theoretically is that yields there will be high. And I see that because I run a business there um, where a, a, a version of what we do is financing of the businesses on our platform. And we can command yields that, and when I tell Americans, they're like, oh, that's crazy, but people actually pay those yields and the um, default rates are pretty low. Um, my question to you in, in particular is why is it difficult um, for the impact industry of the U.S. to try to make that leap to invest in the global south where there is need for capital? A lot of the people who need that money are women. 70% um, of the small businesses are run by women. Um, the businesses they are running are livelihood businesses. So it's somewhat subsistence, um, but also serving the community with specific needs that they have. Um, even if you were to invest into, say, maybe a, a solar business that was um, empowering this, this um, small business owners, um, you can see the direct impact. These people don't, don't have electricity. Right. So they're getting electricity and they're doing it in a way that is sustainable. So you hit a lot of the buckets yeah. easily and you're getting the yields that make sense. Um, inflation, I'll give you an example, Nigeria's inflation is about 18%. Mm -hmm. uh, microfinance there is able to get back in a year north of 40, 40%. With default rates under 70%, sorry, under um, 90, 95%, 98%. Um, so loss rate somewhere around two to three percent in a year. So um, what, what, what I, when I speak to American investment managers, even in the um, impact investing space, there's always a reluctance of, hey, I don't want to go into that market. My business, even though I didn't start it for the VC space, is funded by VC you know, because they seem to want to make that risk um, leap that even the impact investors that I would think normally would invest into businesses like mine don't want to make. So I want to understand what those constraints are and what entrepreneurs like myself, policymakers in the global south can do to help to remove those constraints. Well, well, it's funny that these guys are looking at me, but, um, but basically I would say a couple things. One is I would go back to what Ashley was talking about. And we do, you know, there are f funds like there, there are Calvert notes where they, they um, essentially pick entrepreneurs on a, on a, a large scale in different countries, in the global south, in Africa, in you know countries that aren't as developed to fund, to do micro lending, okay? So that's, that's one thing. Part of, there's, there's a couple things that I think that we've run into. One is we don't, our, we don't want our clients to get that kind of return on that kind of a loan. Okay, so unlike the VC people, okay, we don't want that that big spread because we think even if they can pay it and even if the default rate is low, it would be even lower if it costs the the, the ultimate borrower less, right? So it, so from a business perspective, it's not about trying to make money, you know, tons of money. It's about, you know, finding a project where you know that the ultimate borrower isn't getting screwed. Now, I know I've talked to the outside investment department about this from time to time because we, I, and I'm, so I'm gonna let Ashley talk about why we focus more on the US at this particular moment in time. Um, Cause I think she's gonna say what I was about to say and you might as well say it. Well, maybe, let's, 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 see, let's see what I do. <laughs> right. um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, so, I'll, so I, as you know, I studied Arabic for like seven years and it was actually my second time there. I thought I was gonna get a PhD and, and, and be in the academic side. And, I, and I, I won't go into it, but I was in a scenario where I basically didn't have the cultural competency, right? To, to, to have an opinion. And actually we talked about this last night, which is I think I, and I think some of our clients feel that they understand the United States issues, right? I think to Paige's point about what that experience was, was like at that rally, so many of our clients have that, and I think feel extremely called to intervene at very local levels. Even like, well, like for example, it'll be something as simple as um, we'll have a Massachusetts-based client. I'm like, do you wanna help this 
California farm? And they're like, yeah, sure, but do you have any Massachusetts? So I feel like people gravitate towards things that they see, that they feel, that they understand and they experience. And so I think impact investing, people do it because they really care. They really do. And I think that they can they care about issues that they're proximate to. I think that's the other thing we talked about is being in proximity, right? And it's like, I'm not in proximity to any of these, which is maybe a you know, fault of mine, but I think that a lot of impact investors feel like they don't have the expertise, right? They don't have the understanding to say what what justice looks like in certain contexts. And I think that's where it gets really hard. And so we'll look at things like I look at that 18% and I'm like, oh my goodness, like that feels extremely extractive to me. Right. But in the cultural context, you're like, actually 12% looks amazing. And so I think that um, part of it is the nature of impact investing, the nature of who's participating. In the scheme of things, it's still quite small, right, compared to the broader industry. And I think people have a bias towards issues that they understand. Though I think that the nature of that's changing too, right? All that you're seeing teams start to change who's, who, who works within them. And I think are able to navigate those more and better, but I'd say that to date that has been the hesitancy, which is it's hard to understand our place. I mean, I think my place, right, which is like ridiculous because you're like, you're in America, like, you know, you have so much power and privilege, but I think when it comes down to it, making some of those calls, it gets really challenging. And that goes back to something Paige was talking about, about people telling, you know, telling their secrets and developing trust, mm -hmm. right? So were we to look at so something that was happening in the global south or you know we would need to feel very confident that that the criteria that we care about around race and gender and income inequality human rights you know and and all was not that that was being in, embedded in the the product or whatever it is we're going to the investment right and that and trust that there wasn't going to be an extractive component right because that is core to our values at the firm i think with venture you know good for them i mean good for you for for getting the funding but they're you know they are looking for a return Right. And there are a lot of impact investors out there and they're coming to us. Well, we can get, you know, this return on this, you know, kind of really edgy investment that's helping these people. I, there's something, you know, they can do that. But that but we have these we've in addition to the proximity thing, which I think is real. I mean, we do have clients who have asked for things, you know, outside. But how do we know? How do we know? That, that that's a fair wage for the for the woman who's purchasing the sewing machine who's you know you know right. helping develop this small family yeah. business and the only other thing I would add I mean home bias is very well documented right so it's but it's kind of also the maturity of the field right so if you look at public markets which are well you know have been around for much longer than the private space emerging market allocation didn't start till what 25 years back right the social impact space is still in the early phases right julie's for you know north star 30-year history we're one of the earlier firms around so there there's this whole maturity element that comes into play as well and still even public markets because of the governance risks right it's not just the, the home bias it's the country gov governance risk how do we know that the money is not going to get Feel, you know, just squandered away in all kinds of other things as we hear in news and things like that. You know, emerging market allocation, even in public markets, which are well mature and all this with all that, is still a sleeve, right? The dominant is that. So I think there's time element to it, right? There's, uh, you know, when the question you asked, where are we headed? As you start seeing these interlinkages, there's going to be more and more need for capital to go in different places. But I just think we're earlier there. I would just add, like even when I was at um, the philanthropic VC in New York years ago, you know, we had a hard time quantifying impact, right? And we had investors, large multinational companies, you know, that were based in New York, and we struggled to figure out, okay, how many jobs did we have? How much, you know, growth did we really see? And so, when you think about investment, if you can't, if you are struggling to figuring out what is the impact on a local scale that you can see, taking that to a broader scale is even that much harder. And investors are going to ask for that quantification. 
can we do Yeah, 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 that's fine. Hey, hey. Um, oh, wait, you need your mic. The mic. Yeah, let's see if I can bring it. I, I can repeat your question. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I guess the question is, I came with this question into the session. It's like a moral question I have in me, which is, I know my math and I get those emails from quantitative finance firms being like, we're going to give you this much money, please come for us. Mm -hmm. but this, and I'm an immigrant and I don't want to help my family. But on the other hand, like, I do want to do nonprofit work and I do want to make the world a better place and I'm really torn. So like, how do you even go about something like this when it's like, I don't know. So that's my question. To the philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the the question just so that the did you get the yeah. question? Did you get did, it? Do you want to interview? I can I can if just can basically summarize, so, yeah, summarize. So basically, okay. the question is, you know, here you are at this point in your life where you've got these values that you care very much about, and you're you're also knowing that you need to send the you know money home, and there's a real financial impact, right, on your life. Um, I think a couple of us have felt that. You know, we've articulated that. I think. Um, you know, you have to, I know, I mean, even, you know, Ashley, uh, this was a concern for her in coming to North Star as opposed to going to, you know, some big bank or some big foundation or whatever that would be happy to have her talent and her, her just <laughs> Sorry, I was sun, your face, but that sunny was personality, that. right? So what you have to do is you have to do the, you have to do the math, right? And you have to figure out, okay, how do I weigh that? There's also, there's a torture factor too that you have to include because you could be tortured in the environment that is gonna pay you the most, right? Um, and you could be tortured by the amount of hours that you have to work or the, the people that you have to work with or whatever. Um, and so you really just have to, you have to learn and try to see if there's something in between. And I actually, at this point, there are lots of firms that are looking you know, that, that are saying that they're offering kind of this in between, right? There are lots of firms that claim to, I don't know exactly what your interests are, but that claim to be doing, uh, doing well and, you know, for their, they have these big moral beliefs that they're trying to, to, um, you know, to have you live as, as an employee, right? They're trying to, to make it a better place, the world a better place. Go ahead, Paige. Yeah, I'll build on that a little bit. So some really helpful advice that I got at a big decision moment was someone who said, if you're in a boat in the middle of a lake and you don't know exactly where you're trying to get to, you just have to pick one spot on the shore. And what I'm hearing from you is that you do have some guiding principles here, right? You have some responsibilities that you feel to your family and that's extremely valid. Maybe you have a number in mind that's your, that's your bottom line, must hit, right? So you can use those as guiding principles and then remember that you're not signing a blood oath. You know, this is not a lifelong commitment. So when you think about your, your must haves and your values and what you, what, how you might be willing to compromise work-life balance for X number of years. I mean, those are experiments, right? You're running an experiment on your life and you can put a time frame around it. I'm gonna run this experiment for three years. I'm gonna run this, ex and you're gonna gather so much information and none of that's going to be wasted. I think if there's one thing that's really unifying in our experiences, we did a lot of weird different things and none of it was wasted because, right. you know, because when you're 60, you're going to know what all, what <laughs> The golden all thread all will be that... so clear. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think the thing that thing I'd add is I've talked to a lot of people who want to be an impact investing. And I'm kind of like, well, what do you like to do all day? Right? And they're like, well, I, I don't like to ride. I don't like to do it. And I'm like, I'm not sure you'd really like impact investing. Right? And so I think it's like worthwhile to step back and say, what do you like to do? Because I think that this industry is mature enough that you can kind of find something. I, I think, I, well, we'll talk. It sounds like there's like some <laughs> things out there. I think that, but I would focus more on like, what is the function? What, because like we're all in impact investing or what, whatever this field and all of our jobs look so different. And so I would say, what do you want to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis and got, like use it that way? Because I think there's ways to find, you know, there's ways to get there. But really, at the end, at the end of the day, you want to do, be doing something you really love doing functionally. That's true. Um, but I also think it's important to 
build your skill sets, mm -hmm. hone your skill sets, and refine those skill sets before you are truly able to harness and make the impact that you think you want, right? So I think, um, really you know, when you think yeah. about, you know, where you go and who's courting you, you know, think about what are you learning and what are you growing and then how can you leverage and utilize those skill sets down the road. Awesome. We have time for one more question. Hi, um, thanks very much for the session. Thanks, Sue and Christine. Um, I guess I had a question a bit more about the investment strategy um, and just thinking about how you balance kind of clients who might have a, a particular view on a particular issue versus more of a sort of proactive. I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, how do you manage a proactive versus a reactive kind of issue um, where you might see the firm has a particular kind of long term view about where you'd like to make investments? Um, and where clients might have particular needs. Yes, I can um, start with that and then my colleagues can jump in. So in terms of our investment philosophy, right, our investment philosophy is that we want to invest in these market leaders that are solving some of these most important problems related to the secular trends that we see in the world, ecological limits being one of them. And then we are going to use our shareholder rights to help these companies be an agent of change in the capital markets. Really, that's the overall philosophy. But we, we even crystallize that when we say what change. For us, we have crystallized that as our five pillar framework. We are very focused on gender and racial equity, economic um, equity, human rights, and then looking at the corporate governance. That's the five, the five pillars that- Environmental justice. Too. Sorry, environmental justice. Those are the five pillars that we focus on, right? So when our clients come to us, we are very explicit about this is the values that we're going to. Doesn't mean that somebody, and we do have clients like that, somebody who really cares about animal rights, right? It's not, the, but that's not our core of that. With that client, we're gonna incorporate their wishes into the portfolio like we, you know, we, we have- buy some. Yeah. yeah, we won't buy things that are in complete violation of that. But that's our overarching framework. But there is another component to what we do, which is we learn from our clients, right? So it's a two-way dialogue. It, if you're going to do the work that we're doing, which is systemic social change, it's very important that you don't sit in your ivory tower and just discuss amongst yourself. You really need to get out there, get the viewpoints of what people are thinking. You know, big thing is we read a lot, but also engaging with our clients. So for example, this whole um, question about uh, fair chance hiring, which is that we want to encourage companies to try to get the root cause of this whole racial and inequity piece is really coming from corporate America and the big companies because public companies can create a huge number of jobs, right? And get people gainfully employed so they don't fall back into this whole trap of, you know, going back to the pres uh, criminal prison system and so forth. So to get that whole idea came about from Julie's conversations with a client who was working with the- Yeah, the so, so um, I have, cli I have uh, clients, one's a psychiatrist and the other one is an internal medicine doctor at a local health clinic, right? And a lot of the, what they were seeing and they, they worked at various, uh, I don't know if they actually worked at healthcare for the homeless, but they're in that community and so, what they were noticing was that a lot of people had just been released for, you know, a lot of their clients, you know, would come and they would be, they're working with um, very edgy populations, okay, very troubled populations in the case of the psychiatrist, right? Somebody totally traumatized. Um, these folks were coming from the prison system and they said, we want to do something about prisons, you know, and so I was like, okay, you know, and I had no idea, you know, I just thought about it. And then, so I started going to some conferences and I started thinking about how can we do this? And, you know, what, obviously giving money to groups that are doing interesting things is certainly an option for them. And, but how do we incorporate that into their investment strategy? Well, we had to do a lot of research. Well, where does prison, where do prisons exist? Right? So it was really listening. The thing that I was wondering if you were asking though, and this is something that Paige and I have dealt with a lot is we have a lot of people who are of the, the young, 
-hmm. coming in and saying, I don't want to have, you know, I have inherited all this money from my parents. You know, they were, they made all this money. I can't stand it. I don't want to be in public markets. I just want to create change. Mm -hmm. Right. And those folks, Paige and I are, what we try to do is get them to take, all right, let's step back. We know you're privileged. We know you're wealthy. Let's step back and see what are the assumptions that you have around your cash flow mm -hmm. on a on a on a daily basis? Yeah. Who's paying your cell phone bill? That's right. <laughs> so why are you talking about that? <laughs> yeah. So when a younger client comes to us and has a lot of shame and guilt around this inheritance that they have and their relationship to their money is this is this disgusting thing that has happened to me. And sometimes, so then it's a process of helping them understand how much do you actually spend? And how, how old are you now? How do you expect this is going to change over time? Are you working part-time or full-time right now? How do you expect that to change? Do you wanna have a family? Do you know how much long-term care insurance, long-term care <laughs> costs, right? So part of, part of what we're doing is, is education and also in a delicate way, helping them understand that trying that just getting rid of all of their money with this underlying assumption that maybe they haven't quite noticed yet, that someone is still going to come along and bail them out is actually the ultimate form of privilege. Right. That we can, I can just give it all away and I'm still gonna be fine and it's like, Okay, well, <laughs> let's just let's figure out how much you spend at restaurants each month. You know, right. so, so when you so yeah. yeah, so when we're going through these exercises with people, it's a little challenging because everybody wants to do you know sort of the outside investment thing, right? Which is what what Ashley's doing, and they want to say, hey, I want to take this two hundred fifty thousand dollars that my grandmother just gave me and put it into these community loan things. Well, then. You know, what if they need the money for something? What if they decide to go to graduate school? Well, in some cases, their parents will just fund that too. Yep. Okay, but we need to understand that before we can help them make decisions about, you know, how do they engage with these resources, right? And and a lot of times folks are who are really, I don't want this money or I don't appreciate where this came from or these are my values and this doesn't fit, you know, really have a super hard time yeah. sitting down and really delving into their privilege. And when I, you know, I say, okay, who's paying your cell phone bill? Are you still on the family plan? Your car dies on the side of the road. You know, what do you do? You call AAA and you're on your dad's policy. Yeah, you, you know, that. those kinds of uh, things really make a difference um, in, in, it's the difference between being, you know, having privilege and not, not. So we have to, inc we have to get people, we try to get everybody to talk about what their real deal is, yeah. um, to tell their secrets, to really get in there. Right? And, and I mean, I'm, I'm relaying all this in a very lighthearted, jokey way, because I, I think it's incredible that all of you showed up here at 6 PM to talk to us. So I'm, we're trying to keep it, you know, a little interesting, but, but part of my job is, um, is, is actually having genuine compassion for my clients, which I have. And even though I'm, you know, kind of ribbing on them right now, I, I see that my clients are investing in us for very worthwhile reasons. And that means a lot to me. And so my job is to create a non-judge, an actually non-judgmental space where they can, where they can bring these issues and talk to, talk to me honestly about it and have conversations that they might not be having with anyone else, including even family members. So. Yeah. Right. And, you know, things like philanthropy and all that. So, I mean, that's those are part of those. Yeah. That's what grows out of the conversations. Go ahead, Ashley. Oh, um, <laughs> I, I, I haven't even thought of it. I don't know, man. I know. I mean, uh, what was the question? No, I think that like, <laughs> we oh, <laughs> <laughs> how do we work? We act in how do we, so we have our values. How do we reflect client values? Oh, okay, yeah. I'd say the other thing is I think we tell them where it's not possible. Like I think we tell. Sorry, is that working? That's I, right. I think we tell them where it's not possible. So, for example, the same group that Julie alluded to that kind of transformed the way that we think about public equity. They're like, okay, great, let's do it in outside investments. And basically, what we learned is uh, to the cultural competency. This is not an area where we feel comfortable investing. This is not an area where we feel comfortable making 
money, this is really best suited for philanthropy. So I think it's also, um, I think the best thing that we can do is being honest about areas where we can intervene from an investment perspective and where we can't, like where we need to rely on other tools like public policy and philanthropy. Great. Okay, anyone else want to say a last word? Well, no, the only, the only thing I'll say is that yeah. the entire firm, like the what we're talking about, and even that question or the way we answer that question, you know, you know, all of the way that we approach what we do has come from, to Nimrod's point, conversations with clients. How are they thinking about stuff? What questions are they asking? What do I see coming up again and again? What is a 22-year-old saying that a 35-year-old is saying completely differently? You know, how do we uh, how do we face the client where they're at, knowing that we've got we know people who are you know we're dealing with people who are a hundred who who are in nursing you know needing nursing care, and we're dealing with people who are right out of college with a huge amount of of wealth. So, all of these stories kind of come together. And we have to, Paige and I in particular, because we deal directly with clients, Ashley, to some extent, you know, those are the kinds of things that we have to sort of, you know, take very seriously. And it's helped us with our approach even to, you know, how much are we going to put in an outside investment? What percentage of the portfolio should do that kind of, should do that? What kind of rate of return are we looking for? How much should go into stocks? How much should go into fixed income? All of that um, is, is part of of what we do and it's all about listening to um, the people that we serve really. Fantastic, it's a fantastic note to end on. <laughs> um, I'm so grateful for all of you coming tonight and sharing your wisdom and so grateful for the students for being here for learning. <laughs> and the conversation can continue um, for not the whole night, <laughs> but we have dinner next door and our panelists are gonna still be here for a couple more minutes. So if you have any questions, you can address them individually to the panelists. So please join me in a round of applause for our